Thank you. All right. So those of you that uh, do know me uh, know that I don't do slideware. So um, I've got a couple of videos and that's it. Uh, I want to have this more of a, of a, of a conversation. Um, just before I'd like to begin, certainly thank you for uh, organizing this. Um, and certainly, of course, I'd like to thank uh, the Wajek people, traditional owners of the land which we stand. Um, and fantastic for keeping my team's ego in check, because every time we have a great success, I remind them that they were actually designing airfoils 50,000 years ago. Um, so myself, a little bit about, uh, about me, uh, I am not uh, HPC, I am not a data scientist. Uh, I lead those uh, various areas within uh, my organization. Um, and what we have found is actually bring people from the business. I'm more profit and loss, uh, spent seven years in mergers and acquisitions, uh, all of those sorts of good things. Um, but one of the hallmarks of what we do at Woodside is continually retrain uh, our people, and that includes people like me. Um, so I do have a standing competition with some of the uh, data scientists on the team that if they ever actually beat my relative position on a Kaggle data science competition that they get um, a hundred bo dollar bottle of wine of their choice. I haven't had to pay out yet, so that's, that's excellent. Um, so why is Woodside talking at an HPC conference? Those of you that were here last, how many people were here last year? So Sean Gregory, you would have heard him talk? Yep, one of my executives and, 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 and good, certainly good friends. Um, so for this Woodside, this is nothing new to us. We've always been here, right? Um, the oil and gas sector have used HPC in whatever you want to call it for ever since the modern era with seismic interpretations really actually uh, leading the ground here. Um, but we've actually moved on. We've actually found additional uses for that, certainly for the full waveform inversion, so using more and more of the signal to extract more of the data and actually uh, hopefully increase the success rate uh, of our uh, exploration as well as the delineation of our reservoirs. Um, we actually have also used it for online simulation. So our uh, finite different simulation packages have actually improved greatly uh, in the past uh, 25 years, and that's what I used to do uh, way back 25 years ago. And now using cloud and HPC uh, clusters to be able to actually vastly increase not only the accuracy, but the number of simulations that we can do to explore different uncertainties. And of course, that then can characterize the risk and makes it uh, far better investment decisions for Woodside. Uh, moving on from reservoir simulation, we actually, uh, above the surface of the Earth, uh, our processes are, are effectively cryogenic process engineering. So huge physics-based simulation needing to optimize these particular facilities. Um, so again, another use of sort of the HPC side of things. Um, I guess I really kind of came into it uh, in January of 2015 uh, when my CEO and CTO, Sean, decided that we wanted to set up a data science team uh, within Woodside. Uh, there was four of us uh, at, the, at the early beginning of that, um, and Lachlan Wallace is my the counterpart. He was in charge of advanced analytics. So the advanced analytics platform today is uh, about 250,000 sensors are streaming into an uh, AWS platform, um, and that's all of the data engineering that has to go into that, all of the error correction, as well as all the predictive models that that uh, entails, and as well as actually uh, managing those models, detecting for when they drift and when they're actually the accuracy de declines, and then start to retrain them. Uh, for myself, for my SINs, uh, more on the unstructured data. So natural language processing, images, um, very much into the supervised machine learning, and I'll give you a couple of examples of what we're doing there, and again, all of that is made uh, uh, available through, through the HPC and the, and the sort of technologies that this room has enabled and others. Um, so I'll give you a couple of examples of what we're doing uh, in the quote-unquote unstructured, or as the media would call it, AI space, cognitive computing, cognitive sciences. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of what we're working on there. Um, the earliest examples was actually really knowledge capture. Uh, we have major capital projects. For us, a small one is a couple of billion dollars. Uh, the latest one we just did was about 15 uh, billion United States dollars. Um, so these are massive, massive projects. But unfortunately, they're actually very lumpy. They don't happen very often. So you can well and truly imagine what happens. All of the engineering designs, all the key decisions, the geological reports, the economic reports, all of that has been put together by a team that is formed around these massive investment decisions. And then when it's over and we're into the operational phase, and remember, 30, you know, $15 billion facility, but the people that run that, there's about 30 people go through the plant gate. So when that actually, that project team falls away and we start to form a new one, how many people here think that, oh yeah, have we actually done the same engineering study over 
and over and over and over again. Of course we have. Just one of these projects will enter, generate more documents, written words, than probably this room could read in a lifetime, let alone 20 of them. Um, so how do you access that? Um, so we actually you know, partnered with IBM in the early days. Uh, not a lot of companies have had success in IBM. There's a lot of criticism out there. Uh, we're actually probably at the opposite end of the scale. Uh, we have pretty much a permanent IBM Watson team around our own data scientists going through a very great number of examples. We're probably up to a two dozen of them now in sort of these uh, AI applications. I'll give you a couple of examples. First one is all of that project data ingest it, read it, and actually being able to query it using natural language questions. What is the maximum weight of a helicopter that can land on the Angel platform? What issues have we had in our firewater pumps? How do you deter birds from landing on helidex? And actually coming up with the paragraphs, not the, not the documents, the actual internal paragraphs of that, and so that people can go in and see that. So you can imagine what a young engineer coming in, what sort of power that they have. Everything that we've ever known is actually just waiting for them to ask the right question. Sound like something we'd probably like in most of our organizations? Absolutely. The other uh, upset, you know, everybody says, well, wow, what great for the young engineers. Actually, it's equally empowering for our actually older generation that are, you know, looking at the retirement. In fact, we had uh, several people actually postpone their own retirement to help us build some of these systems. Can you imagine now retiring, ready to get your gold watch and maybe uh, sit in the Mediterranean or uh, if you're like me down in Pemberton in Western Australia here with a glass of red wine in front of a roaring fire, knowing that every piece of work you've ever done is just sitting there waiting for somebody to ask the question. It's actually pretty empowering. It's actually pretty empowering. So that was one simple Q&A set. Um, Second example, uh, we actually drill uh, offshore oil and gas wells. A cheap one of those things is about $50 million. Uh, and for the expensive production wells, you're not going to get much change out of 200. Um, now, the great thing is when we drill the well, all of the data, and there's about three binders of it when you put the well completion reports, that actually uh, gets submitted to the government, and that's available in PDF form for anybody. It's open. Uh, and that's just to encourage people to make sure you see what's happened before to avoid a BP Gulf of Mexico sort of an incident. Now, how did we actually, if we're going to go drill in that area, how did we actually used to do it? Well, what we did is we actually got somebody to print off each one of those well completion reports. There might be 30 of them, and there are three binders each. Um, and they're just literally the drilling engineers or the mud engineers um, typing away, and this is what happened today. Right? And so you'd go away and you'd actually read that and you'd have little read here tabs and that would usually take uh, four to six weeks for a six person uh, team of geoscientists and drilling engineers to go through. They would use that and say, well, here's the different hazards that occurred. Oh, we had some stuck pipe here. We took a kick there. And then they actually go into the design phase and try to design those hazards out of the system. Does that sort of make sense why you do that? Yeah? Okay. But what if we could design a system where you could just draw a circle on a map? One, two, and bang. All of the hazards have been detected, um, and a few false positives definitely there. Just, you know, we've got confusion matrices too. And actually in depth order, being able to extract those. Now that was done by a combination of supervised learning and text annotation. So there's a couple of different ways that we can do that. Now, the AI systems aren't going to tell you what to do about those hazards or how you actually implement your engineering plans around that, but the sure as heck can actually make the identification a lot easier on that. Now you can take that same approach, and when I said we had 20, I wasn't joking, take that same approach to health and safety. Right? Here's a particular piece of equipment, here's the work I have to do. Here is all the statistically all the hazards that actually have ever happened on similar pieces of equipment or in similar geographical areas ever. Oh, okay. Makes for, you know, if you're a supervisor, you know, rather than the stay safe out there. Imagine going and say, okay, we're ch changing out the bearings on this particular pump. Uh, statistically, we're most likely to get hand injuries when we actually lift the shim up and you know, do whatever. So we need to be take care of that. And remember, it is you know, July in this particular area of the plant. Um, that's when actually people do workovers on that, and we actually want to watch out for co-located co work as well. So it massively makes things easier for us to both analyze incidents and say, hey, I have an idea. I think I have injuries at high rope access um, more often in the wintertime offshore because it's cooler here. And so I actually don't come down and I don't hydrate enough and maybe, that, maybe I just you know, get distracted by I'm always focused on the job. Well, we can actually now do analytics over different databases and different natural language uh, safety reports in order to say, hey, is that true or not true? So tremendously helps that. 
If you take it over to another sort of emerging area and a growing area, cybersecurity. Uh, anybody here with cybersecurity? Nobody here with cybersecurity? Okay. How that actually works, right, is there are several government agencies that actually send out the alerts. So the zero day threats, oh my gosh, somebody's figured out how to hack a PLC. Somebody's ha figured out how to hack this particular software program. Um, literally, your cybersecurity teams, thousands of those will get in every day, at least thousands. Um, and of course, they'll have a threat level from 10. This will allow you to take complete control of the software or the hardware that you're going all the way to sort of zero. It's going to be minorly inconvenient. Um, now imagine being a small cybersecurity team and being able to um, not even get through the level 10 threats uh, when you've got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pieces of equipment. If we can take that and we know how uh, the priority of that equipment to the, to the business and we see all these things coming in, bang, we can instantly smash them together and they wake up in the morning and there you go, here are the activities you take that will lower the risk to your organization by the maximum slope possible. You know, so the, the, all of these applications we've uh, designed and built. Of course, Whenever you start to get into this and you see the power of the, da the data science coming in, you actually always want more. And this has sort of really kicked off our IoT teams. So our IoT teams now are developing sort of wireless sensors with fast Fourier transforms on board, and they can go and magnetically clamp them to our pieces of rotating equipment, pull out the little pin that activates uh, the lower end, and it's all intrinsically safe, it's all encapsulated, so it can be exist in a methane atmosphere, not cause an explosion. Uh, Ten-year battery life cost $140 or $180, depending on who you talk to, uh, each. So effectively trying to drive the cost of data acquisition down, down to zero. So while we were actually doing all of these things and generating these uh, uh, different applications, um, we realized that we were actually uh, making one of the problems that we have in any organization far worse. And again, HPC was actually the solution to it. So that's great. We got a particular IBM Watson application or something else we've got here in our analytics uh, data lake. We actually have our SAP for financial records. We have our document management system. We've got tracking systems. We've got hundreds and hundreds of applications in the organization. Where do you go to be able to find the information you need? So one of the things we postulated in late 2015 is, could we actually take the traditional AI systems, which are deep and narrow, you know, you don't take an AI system that was designed to pick drilling hazards and apply it to law. You know, our lawyers don't talk like anything like our drilling engineers, which is unfortunate because if you have to sit through negotiations, it'd be probably more fun if they did talk like the drillers, but that's, you know, that's what we, we, get, we have. So could we take those traditional structures and actually tip that on its side? and make an AI system that was extremely broad, but narrow. So it wouldn't necessarily know anything, but it would know who to talk to. Could we actually generate a middle manager? That's effectively what a middle manager does, right? I don't know boss, but I know Tim, and I'll go you know, call Tim. And so effectively what that system does is take, what's the maximum weight of a helicopter? Or what is the problems we've had with a fire water pump? Or where is the Woodside Donaldson? Or please show me the invoices for IBM. Or could you please book my leave for me? Now, what does it do then? It takes natural language processing, determines the intent of that. I've got the intent. You need to know something about a fire water pump on the North Rankin plot. Got it. Got those two things. Now, you have a separate subsystem that says, OK, what systems do we have within our organization that would know something about that? Again, simple supervised machine learning, so we can actually, and it knows what, what we're hooked up to. Okay, it's going to direct that to our, maybe our Watson for Capital projects. Or I want to know where the Woodside Donaldson is, one of our LNG carrier ships. LNG is a ship, and you want to know where it is. Ah, I know we've got an application in our geo, uh, geomatics team that actually live tracks the location of our ships. I'm now going to translate your natural language query into a language that that particular system can understand. Now, for the Watson systems, it's pretty easy because they understand natural language. But for the other systems like SAP, you know, you've got to translate a natural language intent into something that an SQL database could sort of understand and have associated scripts around that. So that could do that and pull that up. So we were able to do that and we were able to do that quite successfully. Um, now, when we were building this uh, particular prototype, actually in Austin, Texas, Cindy. Uh, yes, yeah, very, very good. Um, we actually found something that was a bit unusual with this. And something that we necessarily didn't see when we went into this. So we talked about using, you know, being able to control a great virtual system. We found actually it works for robotic systems. Put the exact same software in the side of one of those little nail robots that are cute, but I wouldn't recommend buying them if you want a reliable robot. And 
asking it questions of um, what is the blast propagation of a hot oil pool fire. And of course, the robot would then go ask, do the same sort of thing, and rather than showing you the answer on the screen, it would start to talk to you, a lousy user interface. Then it would give you the Trek file if you're an AI geek, or uh, the paragraph if you're not, and start to read that out to you. Mm, that's not that great. But what we could also do is, OK, robot, wave to the crowd. Well, I've got some elemental skill sets. Again, I know what your intent is through the NLP. OK, how do I actually, I don't, I don't know how to wave. I don't have that skill set. OK, robot, don't worry. I'll teach you how to wave. Now, again, we've got a short-term memory within that system, so it retains contextual information. I'll teach you. Raise your left hand. Open your left hand. Lower your left hand. That's how you wave. Oh, OK, now I know how to wave. Wave to the crowd. Now, it sounds like that's a hello world of programming, right? So it's like, mm, OK, that's kind of interesting. We actually uh, hit on a couple of truths, though, with that. The first one was, now we're actually teaching an AI system to take you know, action in the, in the physical world. That's great. We were able to do that without coding. So that means that somebody other than the 0.0003% of the population that can code in these systems now can actually expand the usability of these systems and build up more complex skill sets from elemental skill sets. That's great. Everybody in the facilities, they don't need to know C++, they don't need to know all this stuff to be able to code these things up. Great. The second one is, oh, you taught the robot how to wave. Mm, a little more profound, we actually taught every robot that exists now or will ever exist how to wave. And if we open source the task libraries, we actually taught everyone in the world how to wave. Oh, OK. That's something interesting. Uh, now. Just to get, I mean, dampen down the expectations, this is still very much in prototype. It's actually not scaling across different bodies yet. That's some of the research. So we shot that little demo video. I love my demo, demo videos. You'll see, and, uh, and you know, took that up to our chain of command. Um, and IBM sort of looked at that too and asked us if they could share that particular piece of information with two or three other of their long-term sort of research partners. Uh, we agreed with that. And sort of, if you play the first video there, I'll show you the sort of the, uh, the result of that particular video and that work done uh, with the IBM team. Come on. What's really exciting about coming into technology and you're part of the company, we really see that robotics could be used in many activities to be an assistant to our maintainers and our operators so that they can be removed from some of the more hazardous tasks and allow us to maintain and operate our facilities in a different manner. interested in giving our robots the ability to think and learn on their own to be able to interact better with humans. So our robonaut is a humanoid form. We've actually got over 300 requests from our operational staff on site to actually bring robots in to help them do a particular task that either is inefficient, it's repetitive, or there's some degree of risk associated with that. to push the boundaries of science both on and off of Earth. We're all about developing robots to work successfully and safely side by side with people. This collaboration is an excellent opportunity to do so. <laughs> it is cool. <laughs> That particular robot, uh, the Ro R2 model, the Robonaut, uh, robotic astronaut, there are eight of those in existence. Uh, one of them's in Woodside's labs here in, in Perth. Uh, one of them's with General Motors uh, in, uh, in their facilities in Detroit. Uh, they helped design and build it. Uh, the five are at the Johnson Space Center, and normally the last one is on the ISS. Uh, three months ago, the ISS uh, Robonaut uh, R2B was brought down for upgrades and repair. Uh, currently at the Johnson Space Center, uh, being repaired by the NASA team as well as two Woodside staff, a technician and an electrical engineer. Um, more to learn about 
not only to how to repair robots, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, uh, but then also how do you actually go through and certifying these things to work around humans, what are their process and procedures before it's deemed safe to, to work around the astronauts, and we think that's going to be critical uh, when we actually deploy robots onto our, uh, onto our own site. Um, so that uh, that was uh, in really last mid last year. Uh, so our really robots team going a little little longer than a year, um, or a little less, depending on if you count when we got that robot or our site based robots. So what are we doing with NASA? Um, all of our efforts there are more long term. It tends to be around task autonomy. So what that is, I mean by that. I need you to open that valve, so I don't want to teleoperate those hands, I just want it to actually detect the valve with a point cloud library or some other thing, and be able to actually just open it and then scale that slightly different valve. Yeah, I still know how to do that. Um, so that action is could be an airlock on a space station during a resupply mission to the Deep Space Gateway, um, which will only have astronauts a couple of times a year. It's the new space station that's being uh, developed, in case people don't know about that. It'll be in a lunar orbit. Um, they're already in, in the design phase of that and have international partners. Astronauts are only going to be there a couple of weeks a year. So you need actually robotic caretakers to actually manage these systems because anybody familiar with space systems knows that everything breaks when it's up there um, because every ounce has to be accounted for. And of course, the last step you do before installing anything on the space station is you put it on a giant rocket and shake the out of it, right? So no surprise, surprise, it's going to break. Um, so around the task autonomy and why that's going to be sort of important is that's actually one piece of a very important puzzle. If it can actually turn the switch on, push the button, pull the lever, or manage that high voltage switch, which we, you know, arc flash, we don't want actually people uh, around high voltage switches. Um, if it can, we can manage that task autonomy, then we actually can combine that with a couple of other key things. First, we can combine that with navigation autonomy, which, you know, SLAM algorithms are all there, and we're, we're largely there on that, um, especially in the semi-structured environments of an industrial uh, liquefied natural gas plant. But the third piece of the critical puddle is, it puzzle is natural language processing. We have tens of thousands of procedures that were written by humans for humans. So if I'm actually approaching a particular pump and I actually need to change the filter in that pump, you better believe that there is going to be a procedure to change the filter in that pump. Step one, close inlet valve. Task autonomy, machine vision. Step two, close outlet valve. Task autonomy, machine vision. Step three, turn power off. Task autonomy, machine vision. Pump is now ready to go. Robot takes picture to make sure, uh, assume that it's uh, uh, correctly isolated. That can go to a human, verify that. Robot goes on to the next job. Maintenance crew come in, take that pump out, replace it with a new one. Sound like a sort of a valuable thing for us to be wanting to do? Uh, absolutely. But the first stage of, the, uh, of our robotics program is actually going to be more centered around the robotic caretakers for remote facilities. I mentioned NASA's Deep Space Gateway. We actually have offshore uh, oil and gas facilities that there is nobody on board. They're completely uncrewed. So when one of our sensors picks something up, one of our predictive algorithms get triggered, we have actually no choice now but to put five to six people in a helicopter and fly them hundreds of kilometers offshore. If you're familiar with the oil and gas sector, the most dangerous activity we have statistically is putting people in a helicopter and flying them offshore. Each one of those trips is probably around $25,000. We could probably build a surveillance robot for that. Saves one trip, paid for itself. Our first offshore trials, both in autonomous and teleoperations mode, will be on October 9th to October 12th this year. Um, so we'll be testing out all of the systems, the communication, the back-end analytics, all of that sort of stuff, end-to-end, -end, see if it all works in the real world. So that's one of the things that we're doing with that. So I guess in terms of giving you guys a little bit of an overview of how we're utilizing the sort of um, HPC, I wanted to actually spend a little bit of time on think where we're going and then I think some of the key success factors. Um, and, and one of them is actually uh, certainly everybody in this room uh, gets it. I think the first one is... Um, these technologies are almost ubiquitous. I don't actually think since, probably and since we got desktop computers, we haven't been at a place that we're at right now with these sorts of technologies. Everything I've described to you, what Woodside is doing as an energy company, it equally applies to agriculture, it equally applies to mining, it equally applies to space. In fact, you know, no coincidence that when the Australian government announced the Australian Space Agency uh, two months ago, they actually announced it from our labs. 
Um, so I think that's one of the key things. The other key things is actually getting these technologies, whether they're pure digital, whether they are hardware, software, whether they're robotic, whether they're sensors, get them in the field as soon as possible to see them working in the real world. And I'll, I'll show you the second video on that, um, on what we're actually doing with our uh, robotic uh, systems in, in the real world. So this was shot uh, a couple of months ago. We got our first uh, surveillance robots. Uh, in October of last year. So we're actually combining uh, the thermal sensors, ultrasonic sensors, uh, obviously the LiDAR, and you're going and seeing here now an electrical switch cabinet. So this is an electrical substation, uh, about 30 years old. There are, would be tens and t hundreds of thousands of these worldwide. Uh, when one of those switches fails, oh boy, is that a huge explosion and blows the doors off. Right? Um, so if we can measure thermal anomalies or sniff for ozone prior to uh, that occurring, that would be great for us. We also have turbine enclosures. Uh, see, these are aeroderivative turbines and, and pumps. Uh, when then they're in operation, they're effectively no-go zones for humans. It can get up to about 90 degrees Celsius in that. Uh, a tip of the day, your 3D printed mounts uh, will melt at 80 degrees if you use the wrong uh, method, so that was a learning. Um, can we actually then use the robots to go in and monitor the equipment um, while that's in operation when normally we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, you see in the camera jitter here, that's actually just doing a zero point turn on the, on the grading. Um, operation staff, this is, this is actually great to be able to go ahead and, uh, and see the equipment while it's running. Um, a little bit of what, what you're seeing under the hood when we actually go and do the outdoor, uh, so there's some autom autonomous navigation. Um, actually, could you stop this video right here just for a second, just pause it? Yeah. So um, this, here, this is a FinFan deck, so an LNG train is effectively a giant refrigerator. Um, and so we actually take methane gas, same stuff you cook with, cryogenically clue it to minus 160 degrees Celsius, turns into a liquid, we ship it around the world, keeps the lights on in Tokyo. Right, so effectively the FinFan deck is the back of your refrigerator. You go and touch the back of your refrigerator, it's hot. Yeah, this is hot up there too, 50 to 60 degrees Celsius. And this is where we dump all the waste heat effectively to atmosphere. There's about 930 odd of these fin fans up there. Um, and when one of them goes down, um, we saw the presentation earlier on the acoustic monitoring. That, that's just absolutely. When one of them goes down, you can see the drop in production. But we necessarily don't want people up there. And so we're looking at the acoustics, fixed sensors, and now a combination of mobile, uh, mobile acoustics, mobile thermal sensors to actually, uh, you can start it up again, thank you, uh, to see actually uh, monitor the condition of the equipment um, to see actually and have our uh, operators, if they do have to go up there, make sure that they actually have to see three pieces of equipment, not 930. So again, you can see the, the, the issues that we're going to be dealing with is how do we actually get more processing onto the, the, the local machines, um, and also then how do we actually, uh, with lower latency, enable teleoperations. Uh, one of the philosophies we have is we want our operation staff to be able to teleoperate any robot, not just have them operate in autonomous mode, because if an unforeseen situation comes along, we want to actually be able to teleoperate in and either use them as observation platforms, as you can see here. This is sort of an unplanned sort of activity they were doing a, a mock rescue um, and so that's Ripley one of our uh, um, mobile and, and manipulation platforms um, it was interesting uh, that's about a 15 kilogram rescue dummy uh, I actually made the observation to my head of Allison uh, my head of robotics I said well is that would that actually though be able to, to drag uh, you know a, a 90 kilogram uh, dummy um, out of the line of fire uh, which she's replied I don't know let's see lie down um, and yes, sir, I should have saw that coming. Uh, and it, it was successfully dragged me, and yeah, uh, painfully, but it dragged me. Um, that robot you saw right there at the end um, has actually been already deployed in a real world incident response. Um, this is all public, they've mentioned it now, so I can say. Um, about two months ago, we got a phone call from BHP. Um, they were actually uh, 1.6 kilometers under the ground. They were drilling and uh, hit a pocket of uh, pressurized water and carbon dioxide gas. Um, they pulled the, the drilling rig out, put a pipe in, cemented around that, and actually put a valve stack on it and closed that valve stack. And there's lots, this is probably half the size of the room would be the, um, would be the area that that drilling rig was in, 1.6 kilometers down and about probably a kilometer long uh, crossroad there. Uh, they were actually drilling for the samples to see what the quality of ore was, and then they can plan the development of the mine. Uh, very unusual to hit an overpressured 
pocket of water and gas and a hard rock mine. Anyway, so what happened? Put a valve stack on, closed it, and uh, were, was relieving the pressure, you know, so it wouldn't flood the entire uh, entire area and get the get the drilling equipment all wet. Unfortunately, then they looked at the gauge and it was 650 odd psi, um, and so you wanted to sort of that was an overpressured situation. How do we actually go and resolve that using robotics? Uh, and so we could get our robots a, a and, and ourselves and Deacon went and we were able to. Uh, it was the Deacon's robot was the hero of the day. They had a different philosophy than us. We wanted to open the valve. They actually had a design just to cut it and able to actually. Um, proceed with that and make the, the situation safe for people. Now again, not directly related to H HPC, but all of the technology that actually enabled that, whether it was wireless communications, whether it was the machine vision, all, whether it was the, the LIDARs that helped us actually navigate around that, um, all of that was actually made possible by the sort of technology that people in this room uh, work on. Um, so I think, you know, it works in the real world. We're, we're seeing more and more demand of it. And I think the, for us, the key sort of enabler with any of these technologies, whether they're pure virtual, whether they're now crossing over into the physical realm, um, what the magic sauce that we found is really is, is the collaboration. Um, you see one of the uh, collaborative efforts that we have with NASA, that's, uh, we've got three or four agreements with them. They actually uh, have a permanent presence on my team here in Perth. So NASA engineers from GSC are really permanently here on my team in, th in three month blocks and we go back there uh, when required. Um, also University of Texas, all of the academic institutions that we have here in, in Perth we certainly use. And actually in University of Queensland, QUT, Center for Robotic Vision. Um, we have actually just had Boeing in our labs and we've been in theirs to, to cross collaborate so this is sort of this technology is actually forming a platform for collaboration across multiple industries um, and, and we're really doing that now and that's some sort of part of the the more exciting things that uh, I think that Australia can offer we're certainly not going to outspend the Europeans we're certainly not going to outspend or put more people on us than than China will be able to um, we certainly don't have the legacy of some of these things that um, the U United States do but we do have across different industries. There's no surprise that Boeing has its autonomous labs here uh, in, in, in Brisbane. There's no surprise that you know m the majority of autonomous mining vehicles are here in Western Australia um, is because I think we're really the experts in actually turning the, the technology that's developed in this room actually into results and into benefit and for society and in, in the real world. And so that, if anything, is so just continue to drive that sort of collaborative approach, um, open and honest approach about what we're doing. Um, um, I think, in, and lessons learned from what we do, we, we're happy to share and actually um, combine that with, with what everybody else's experience in this room would have been. Thank you very much. <laughs>